Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jen Shonger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence. And we're so excited that we have Steve Silverman here, who is an award-winning science writer and New York Times bestselling author of Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity. And in addition, we also are lucky to have Dr. Liz Torres, who is our director of the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, or the NJACE, uh, which is a center funded by the New Jersey Governor's Council for the Medical Research and Treatments of Autism. Uh, she's also a professor of psychology and a computational neuroscientist who directs the Sensory Motor Integration Lab at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey. So Steve, thank you so much for being here. Nice to see you guys. And I'm very, very honored to be here with you, Jen and Liz. So so are we. We couldn't be happier. Thanks. Um, Thanks. So uh, just a quick note about Neurotribes that we will be having a book giveaway. Um, so stay tuned to our social media and our um, emails that we'll be sending out about that. Um, we're so fortunate that Steve signed a, a bunch of book plates for us. We're filming during quarantine, so we weren't able to have him in person, but we're so happy that we could still do this. Um, so Steve, uh, Neurotribes is just, so amazing. It's very personally important to me um, as a mom. Um, I feel like it's just such necessary reading for anyone who loves anyone on the spectrum. And part of why I wanted to have you here today um, was because it's so important to understand um, how we can best support the autistic community and that how we talk about autism and what we understand um, about their lived experience and the neuroscience, it directly influences um, how they're perceived and treated by everyone in society, including people who work directly with them, people who love them, and how they feel about themselves, which is most important. Um, so with that said, um, do you have a family member on the spectrum? And why did you write the book? Um, and what kind of uh, problems did you encounter while writing it? Well, um, I do not have a family member on the spectrum. And I think it's interesting that that is probably the most uh, frequently asked question that I got when the book first came out. Uh, and what interested me sort of societally about that question was that there was an implied understanding that if you didn't have to write about autism because you had a family member on the spectrum, you wouldn't. But I was a science writer. I was a science writer for Wired Magazine for 15 years. And um, so, you know, autism was part of that as I saw it back then, although I see it, some, I see it more in a social justice, uh, through a social justice lens now, but it was actually the autistic community that taught me that. Um, the other question I get asked sometimes is if I'm on the spectrum, and uh, that's from really <laughs> hip, hip people, and I'm not. Um, I mean, I have, you know, many friends who are on the spectrum. Uh, one could even argue that my husband has some spectrum traits and that he has relatives who are autistic. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, don't, I don't have a kid or something like that. And the reason why I wrote about it <clears throat> was that I saw tremendous pain in both the autistic community and the community of people who love and support them. And so if, if you don't mind, if we can go back in history a bit to um, how I ended up writing this book, is that okay? Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah. So um, I'll start pretty early. Um, back in 2000, you know, so it was 20 years ago, <laughs> I was on a boat in Alaska with more than 100 computer programmers. And uh, th this weird event was called a geek cruise. And so we were sailing up and down the Alaskan panhandle. And I didn't know what I was seeing yet, but now I recognize that there were a lot of people who had traits of the spectrum. I wouldn't necessarily say they were diagnosably autistic, right. but there were a lot of people who had spectrum traits on that boat, let's put it that way. And it was a great crew. It was a wonderful cruise. Um, and sort of the star of the cruise was this guy, Larry Wall, who invented a programming language called Perl that was very, very widely used for many years. And there's even pieces of Perl in 
Microsoft software. It made things like Amazon and the Internet Movie Database possible. Um, a, a lot of things that we just take for granted now were made possible by Perl. And Perl is also a very weird programming language. Um, Larry sprinkled throughout the source code quotes from his favorite book, The Lord of the Rings. Um, and the motto of the Perl community could be the motto of the neurodiversity community. There is more than one way to do it. And so Larry was very open to, you know, if you're a 14 year old coder in India with a great idea for the evolution of the language, people would listen to you. It was very flat, like it wasn't hierarchical. So as we're coming back into port, I asked Larry if I could interview him at home. And he said, yeah, sure. I should tell you, we have an autistic daughter. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. Uh, and way back then, it's, it's almost hard to remember this, but it's very relevant. Way back then, um, autism was considered extremely rare. Uh, the estimates of autism's prevalence among American school children were like, uh, I forget, but it was something like one in 6,500 or something like that. And um, so when he said that, it didn't really register so much. I just thought it was interesting. But uh, six months later, I was writing another story about another technologically very adept family in Silicon Valley. The patriarch of the family had built the first computer ever in the Middle East way back in the 1940s. And I asked the sister-in-law of the woman I was profiling if I could come interview her at home. And she said, yeah, sure. By the way, we have an autistic daughter. And I thought, God, that's funny, you know? So I was sitting in uh, my favorite cafe in my neighborhood here in San Francisco where I am now. And I was telling that exact story to a good friend of mine. And a woman at the next table suddenly blurted out, oh my God, do you realize what's going on? And I said, what's going on? And she said, there's an epidemic of autism in Silicon Valley. Something terrible is happening to our children. So I like, you know, as a science writer, I was like, oh my God, you know, but more than, oh my God, I was like, really? Like, you know, <laughs> is it really happening? So I wrote a story for Wired called The Geek Syndrome uh, that came out in 2001. It was supposed to be the cover story, but 9-11 happened. So it was kind of in the back of the magazine. So I thought nobody would ever see it. And it was about um, how the genetics for autism in high tech communities could even provide you with certain advantages, like intense focus, like not caring about going out with the cool, kids to the bar you know, Saturday night or whatever. Like, um, so, you know, in the context of high tech communities, uh, some autistic traits could um, actually be an advantage in employment. So article comes out, I figure no one's ever gonna read it because we're all talking about 9-11. I got email about that article almost every week for 10 years. And the emails were very, uh, heart-wrenching really is the word. They were from autistic people who had been told they were geniuses when they were young, had never had a job because they could not uh, successfully impress an interviewer, you know, who was looking for real team players, strong handshake, you know, whatever. Um, so uh, I also got emails from people who recognized relatives in their family tree from reading descriptions of autism in my article. And I also noticed while writing that article, something that I did mention, I'm very happy that I mentioned it, but um, at the time I didn't quite realize how crucial it would turn out to be. Among the websites that I found while researching that article was a website called the Institute for the Study of the Neurologically Typical by a woman named Loris Tisanchik. And it was very cheeky, as they say in Britain, it was, it was a satire of a oh. medical website. And it was like, there is no cure for neurotypicality, unfortunately, you know. Uh, and so like describe neurotypicality, you know, overly susceptible to peer pressure, et cetera. You know, tendency to make small talk. You know, I thought it was hilarious. And I thought, well, that's certainly a different perspective of what, you know, was being framed everywhere as primarily a medical issue and possibly an epidemic. And, possibly an epidemic caused by vaccines. And in fact, the vaccine debate uh, completely dominated all discussions of autism 
for that whole 10 year period that I was getting those letters. And I thought, well, you know, like whenever it would come up uh, online, if there was a comment section, even if the article was about like autism and employment or autism and access to medical care, the, the people would weigh in with like, you know, it's an epidemic caused by vaccines. And if you say it's not, you're a shill for big pharma, you know? Well, I- I'm today still. Yeah, no. oh, I know it. No, ever more so actually. And well, that's a rabbit hole we don't need to dive into right now. But many studies have shown that autism is not caused by vaccines and is primarily caused by genetics. Um, not exclusively caused by genetics, but very much primarily. And that has been proven over and over again in controlled studies. So I thought, in addition to seeing that, you know, Andrew Wakefield's thesis get disproven over and over again, um, I thought, well, autistic people seem to be worrying about other things than what made me autistic, you know? They seem to be worrying about um, jobs and access to healthcare and access to education and no transition programs out of high school and falling off the cliff after high school. And why does no one ever talk about this stuff? And eventually as a journalist, I traced the source of that problem to the fact that in the early 1990s, the rates of estimates of prevalence of autism went way up. You know, it was like a hockey stick graph. And that was the hockey stick graph that Autism Speaks put everywhere on every website. All the anti-vaccine people would say, you know, like, you know, wake up sheeple, you know, and then there would be this, you know, hockey stick graph. But then if you look to like pretty good sources like the New York Times, it would say the reason for the dramatic increases in estimates of autism prevalence in the early 1990s are a mystery. They're a puzzle. They're a baffling enigma. You know, and I thought, well, after a while, it's like, why is it such an enigma? Why don't we know why this happened? And the more I started to look at it, the more I started to think that something had gone wrong in the, in the transmission of autism history. Uh, that somewhere along the line, we'd lost the plot, really, uh, and that the history of autism, as recounted in thousands of textbooks and Wikipedia, was incorrect. And as I researched, I discovered what mistakes had been made that, in a sense, rendered a huge population of autistic people invisible. So in a sense, the two problems I was trying to solve, two or three, were you know, why is everything that anyone ever says about autism, about vaccines, when they don't seem to cause it in controlled studies, to why are the lives of autistic people and their families so miserable? So miserable that people commit suicide, you know, and why is no one talking about those problems? And then finally, the third problem that I eventually came to was that autism history was wrong, as it had been told by everyone. And so that was why my book that was supposed to take a year turned into a five-year project. Wow. And let's talk about, um, in your book, you cite Jim Sinclair. Who has, yes. Well, he's, his talk was called Don't Mourn For Us. Um, yes. I read it. I recommend it to every parent because I think it's really powerful to hear from the perspective of an autistic person, how it feels when we talk about them in the ways that they've been talked about, you know, for, for the last, you know, six decades or more. Um, and he, you know, he describes autism as, and you cite this in your book, um, autism is a way of being, it colors every experience, every sensation, uh, perception, thought, emotion, and encounter every aspect of existence. So when you think of it that way, um, as opposed to, you know, um, an epidemic, I guess my question would be, how did that change from what initially was thought about autism up until, say, the last 20 years? Like, just come up to the last 20 years and tell us what that kind of path looked like. Yeah, sure. I'm very glad you mentioned Jim Sinclair's Don't Mourn for Us. Uh, everyone should read it, every autistic person and every parent and every educator. Um, 
Jim prefers gender neutral pronouns, um, uh, but it's a, it's a foundational document in the same way that like Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail is a foundational document in the civil rights movement. Jim's Don't Mourn For Us is a, is a foundational document in the autism rights movement. And what happened to my book was that I went from um, writing a science book about this curious you know, set of medical issues or whatever, to writing a social justice book about the journey of a people to autonomy, liberation, and power, political power. Uh, let me just throw in a quick little, um, uh, what would you call it? Well, a quick little recommendation here. Um, it's not autism specific, but everyone should watch Crip Camp the documentary on Netflix now. It is unbelievable. It's about like a camp for very disabled people that was run by hippies in the 70s. The kids who went to that camp became so empowered that they went on to completely change the world um, and uh, participate in the series of revolutions that gave disabled people more access to society. Crip camp, check it out. Uh, but in any case, I realized that I was writing about these people, not like a medical situation, these people who were fully human beings. Uh, you know, as soon as I started talking to, to autistic people, even for geek syndrome, I noticed that like some of the things that were widely accepted as true were uh, false, they were myths. Uh, and I'll give you a very clear example. Um, I was encouraged to go to a conference called Autreat that was run by autistic people for autistic people early on in my research. And I would say that was the most crucial thing that I did. And I did it on the recommendation of Ari Niemann, who was the founder of um, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network and was, on, uh, was chosen by President Obama for the National Council on Disability. Um, but in any case, so... I go to Autreat and when I first uh, you know, thought of going there, I thought, so am I gonna see a bunch of people who you know, can't socialize and are like painfully awkward and you know, is it gonna be like really sad? And, you know, actually they were thrilled <laughs> to be together and it was really fun. And um, there were these kind of amusing incidents as I confronted my own A, myths about autism, and B, my neurotypical impairments. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I met a guy uh, there the first day and we had a nice chat. And then the next day I ran into him in the cafeteria and I did the typical neurotypical thing, which is to try to make conversation. So I went up to him and I said, hey buddy, how did you sleep? And he looked at me and said, why? It's a really good question, you know. And uh, so another thing that happened that was a big moment was um, Ari Niemann, the guy who told me to be there, had just finally been seated on uh, the National Council on Disability after people had tried to block him for ableist reasons. Um, so he arrived like the second day and he walks into the room and he was like the homecoming hero sort of. And he walks into the room and a young woman at the back of the room says, we love you, Ari, if we were capable of feeling such an emotion. <laughs> and so, you know, I realized that the notion that autistic people don't get humor, you know, which is, was very widespread at the time. You see it everywhere. Um, well, that wasn't true. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of things that I learned were not true about autistic people by seeing them outside of a freaking clinic you know, it's like they were finally in an environment that was designed for them, where sensory overload was reduced to a minimum, where they were creating the social agenda. You know, you didn't have to go, like, sure, they had talks all day. You didn't have to go. Opportunity, not pressure, was one of the mottos of Autry, you know. So in a sense, I saw an autistic utopia, really, you know, and it wasn't sad. It was beautiful. And it even liberated me in some ways, like, you know, I'm, I'm, shall we say, a large person, person of size, 
And, you know, in neurotypical society, I feel like people are constantly judging me. You know, it's like as if I walk into a crowded cafe, it's like, you know, <laughs> people are like, okay. Um, there, not, you know, there was none of that. Like it didn't even ooze out of people's pores. You know, it was like everybody was okay. If you were stimming, that's fine. One of the most beautiful things I saw was a couple that had met and gotten married at Autry the previous year holding hands and stimming together. That was really beautiful. So when I, I remember coming back from Autry and sitting at my desk and I'm like writing some typically clinical description, you know, difficulty making eye contact, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking like, Steve, stop. Like I literally remember a distinct moment, like stop typing, stop repeating those myths. You were just with these people for a week. They're not like that. You know, and that was the moment that my book became sort of more a social justice book and less of a medical book, really. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that you said that because there's another quote that I love uh, by Donna Williams. Um, it says, right from the start, from the time someone came up with the word autism, the condition has been judged from the outside by its appearances and not from the inside to how it's experienced. And I wonder Absolutely. if... You and Liz, um, what do you think about um, kind of the tension between um, an autistic identity, like my daughter, I, she, I, she's part of that community. I'm so grateful for, for you know, everyone there that has transformed our lives. Um, you know, they're paving a path for her. Um, what do you think about the baggage that comes with autism as a diagnosis. Um, and just one more thing is, so Judy Endow, who's uh, an autistic woman says- I love Judy Endow. She's amazing. I highly yeah. recommend her. She's totally amazing. <laughs> um, so she says, because a diagnosis is based on deviation from accepted normal, an autism diagnosis shows a picture of what autistics are not and highlights what we cannot do as, a pair, as compared to the majority normal. A diagnosis says nothing at all about the human beings we are or what we can do. Our abilities and skills often remain unnoticed and untapped. So what do you both think about um, the way that we diagnose people, um, you know, and what people assume based on that diagnosis versus the need for the identity and the community? And how do we, how do we handle that? <laughs> That's a, that's a great question, and I have a lot to say about the history of that, but Liz, do you want to, uh, do you want to go for that? Sure. Um, so I, I, the, the take I have on it is uh, slightly different uh, in terms of um, saying that the, the, the diagnosis is, is based on deviations from the norm. It's not. It's based on, on assumed deviations from the norm, because as it turns out, it has never, ever, ever been measured in neurotypical. So all these standardized tests that we hear about out there were never done on neurotypicals. So technically, a norm-based test is one that is, uh, that is done on, on neurotypical people across all ages. And that establishes a normative data set that you measure deviations from. But this was never done. It was assumed. And that poses tremendous challenges for the scientific community. So that's where I that's that's where my my whole you know issue with the the current model is. Uh, it's a deficit model based on assumptions, it, never it was never measured objectively, physically. And, and let me just like be clear about something. Just because you put a number on something and you come up with a scale of discrete numbers, one, two, three, all the way to 10, for example, that doesn't make it objective. It's still a subjective diagnosis and it's still a subjective way of, of trying to quantify something. And I praise that. It's been tried to to be you know to quantify something, but to put so much hold on something that is just an assumption, it's just baffling to me. You know, I, I you know so one of the things that we did as a lab of of 
somatic sensory motor innovation and physiological uh, measuring physiological activity was precisely to take those instruments that make those assumptions and measure what neurotypicals are like according to those autistic inventories. And the, 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 the results are surprising. I'm gonna reserve that for when we publish it, but it's nothing like what we, we've heard. And so the lesson for that, from that exercise is um, we should never assume anything. We, we should measure it scientifically. We should apply the scientific method, which is measure, reproduce, discuss, criticize, improve, and uh, and we should change that most definitely this deficit model into one that quantifies the capacity, the potential, the readiness for social interactions that every single one of those kids and adults and young adolescents have because we're all human this is us it's not a matter of you know putting people in a bucket this is everybody and it, it it's much better we're, we're much better off embracing not not just uh we're way past that kind of uh awareness way past that and we thank the movement that has started that deeply because it made us aware of that but now, right now, it's more of embracing that condition and highlighting the potential rather than highlighting deficits of weaknesses. I, I was always telling Jen about my own weaknesses and my own deficits. I am a terrible navigator. I get lost. I drive out there and it's like, where am I? What am I going to do? What, and it's just, if, if I had to live all my life with that, somebody telling telling me you're a terrible navigator and you don't know the first thing about driving and you you should not you know, it would be very it would be it would be paralyzing how could i you know i'm very good at other things so i go and do all those things and that's the way this should be treated all the good things that uh that we can do whether we label ourselves autistic or otherwise doesn't matter it's just the goodness in in all of us and the potential so that's my take on it. That's great. And uh, I want to add to that, that um, a problem that has afflicted the neuroscience of autism for, for decades, really, is that, you know, every uh, couple of months, uh, it hasn't been so much in the news now because there's so much horrible news, but every couple of months you'll see like there's a study. Okay, scientists implicate too much white matter in autism. Then if you're paying attention, six months later, you'll see scientists implicate too little white matter in autism. And Michelle Dawson, who is an autistic scientist in Canada who works with a, another scientist named Laurent Motro, has pointed out that what happens is scientists look, you know, they measure something like say the amount of white matter or connections to something or other in the brain. And if they measure it in autistic people, it's obviously pathological because autism is pathological. So that must be the problem, you know? And uh, the result is that we have all uh, this obsession with, you know, measuring the, the physical deficits involved in autism. It's bad science because you're not uh, measuring against neurotypicals um, in any kind of useful way. Um, so that's a big problem. And what I wanted to, to add to the context of this is so much good that is happening now in science even is because people are finally listening to autistic adults. Yeah. And so uh, the stuff about uh, sensory hypersensitivity, nobody was talking about that um, until people like Temple Grandin, who is really the first autistic adult to come out, uh, yeah. in, in society. She started talking about how when she was a little girl, she used to have meltdowns in church because the fabric of her church uh, skirt, you know, would itch her legs. Nobody was talking about that. I, I like I looked, you know, I looked for hypersensitivity in, in, you know, decades of scientific papers. It was not really there until she started talking about it. I think maybe I saw one paper, but um, that was ignored, by the way. Um, many of the things that are now on the agenda for um, 
researchers to start looking for what autistic people really need. Like, not so much like, okay, how do we prevent autistic people from being born? Right. Which is what a lot of the research that was, and we're talking millions and millions of dollars. Like this was yeah. not a trivial investment, you yeah. know? Um, and with virtually nothing going to quality of life for autistic adults. Uh, and in, in fact, until recently, there weren't even any studies of how many autistic adults were out there. Okay, if you're gonna throw around the word epidemic, as even the chief science officer, Jerry Dawson of Autism Speaks threw around at some point a few years ago. Um, if you're gonna throw around the word epidemic, shouldn't there be less autistic adults than autistic kids? Because you'd think, well, if there's an epidemic, there should be more kids with autism now. Well, a, a study by Terry Bruga in the UK uh, several years ago showed that there were just as many autistic adults as autistic kids, but they were relatively undiscovered, like people hadn't asked them. Right. So Terry Bruga sent out researchers to you know, pound the pavement and look for them. And the reason why we didn't hear from autistic adults for so long was because, as I describe in my book for a dozen reasons, autism was considered primarily a problem of childhood. And in fact, Leo Connor, the uh, child psychiatrist who became famous uh, for being the world's leading authority on autism and pretty much introduced the diagnosis to the Western world, um, he considered autism to be a form of, as he put it, childhood psychosis. In fact, he hypothesized that autistic kids would grow up to become schizophrenic adults which they do not, you know, they're two completely separate conditions. Um, so um, basically there were no autistic adults until they could get a diagnosis, which didn't start happening at all until the late eighties. Like people, you know, sometimes, sometimes autistic people, I mean, even like some autistic people don't even know this. Like, you know, sometimes uh, here's a, how could there be, you know, no autistic adult. Well, there were no autistic adults because they couldn't get a diagnosis, you know. And um, if they got a diagnosis, like Temple got a diagnosis um, as a little girl of minimal brain damage, um, there were all these uh, other labels. Like, you know, when the anti vaccine people say, like, well, if it, it's always been here, where were all the autistic adults? They, they were uh, diagnosed with, with, Childhood schizophrenia. Childhood schizophrenia was considered an epidemic in the 1950s and 60s. Now we understand that childhood schizophrenia is very rare. Um, uh, it's not non-existent, but it's very rare. But yet uh, institutions, brutal institutions, were filled with people with childhood schizophrenia uh, back in the 50s and 60s who would now have gotten a diagnosis of autism. And, you know, I have a whole chapter on the movie Rain Man uh, mm -hmm. in my book. People look back and say, oh, Rain Man, God, it's such a terrible stereotype. Like even, you know, really cool autistic people think that. <laughs> yes, it is a stereotype. Yes, he's, you know, counting toothpicks and all this. Yes, at the end of the movie, he has to go back into the institution. Unlike, by the way, as I discovered and talk about in Neurotribes, all the real life models for his character, the real life models for his character were not in institutions because their parents fought to keep them out of them. Right. But, um, you know, a clinician decided that it would be unrealistic to present him as being unable, you know, able to survive outside of an institution. He was the first autistic adult that even many autism clinicians had ever seen, that fictional character, Raymond Babbitt in Rain Man. So that movie, yes, it's a tireless old stereotype now, but it was also a completely revolutionary breakthrough at the time. And it wasn't until Temple Grandin appeared that there was sort of a real life uh, model in the public eye of an autistic adult. And so the reason why we're only hearing from autistic adults now, or you know, for the last 20 years, the reason why we're only getting this positive influence on the direction of research and science, which is increasing all the time, which is really good, is because there were no autistic adults, according to the psychiatric establishment, mm 
in the, you know, up until the late 80s. And even then, um, I spoke to a woman who started diagnosing autism in the 1940s. So right after Leo Connor introduced the diagnosis, she told me that <clears throat> another reason why autism was considered so rare was she, she told me that through the 80s, if parents brought a kid to her, they had used for evaluation, they had usually been through 10 therapists before getting to her, before they found someone who could diagnose autism. How many families have the resources to doctor shop their way right. through 10 therapists? Right. You know? So there are a lot of reasons why autism was mistakenly considered rare. And there were a lot of reasons why autistic voices uh, were silenced because nobody interviews a five-year-old kid. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. so could, I ask, speaking up. could I add something to yes. uh, go back to the, because I like to pick up where uh, go, going back to perhaps shifting the paradigm to one in which instead of focusing so much on, on measuring things to understand the causes of autism, which is more or less the paradigm right now in the scientific community, why don't we measure things to actually understand how to help, how to, how to build support and accommodation so that the person can uh, flourish and, and function, uh, be comfortable and so on. And I, I thought that one possible way to do that was to borrow from other fields in the, in the neurological um, community, which have a lot of overlapping uh, phenotypic descriptions. And, but, and yet they have, uh, these communities have uh, built accommodations and have built support and don't have a critical uh, view or, or a deficit model. They rather listen to the, to the people that they're doing the research for. And, a case in point is the ataxia uh, community. I go to their international society conference and you can see there how the, the, the community of, of, of patients and people affected are the ones who are driving the science and asking simple things for, for like, okay, I want you to help me uh, walk better. I want you to minimize the falls that I have. I want you to do research that help me eat my food independently and have greater autonomy because at the end of the day, that's all what all of us want that, to have autonomy and, and dignity in our lives, not to have to depend on somebody who may, be, may have a bad day and just treat us poorly and so on. So I'd like, if possible, Steve, if you could comment on alternatives to this deficit model where we could actually highlight the positive in, in autism. And, one thing, another thing after that is if we could get into the minimally variable uh, side of autism, which has, uh, has been, it's a, it's a completely different um, population in both science and, you know, we know very little how to, how to help, how to support this population. And it's one that really needs our, our support and our science. Um, so if you could comment on that after, after the, the comment on um, creating support and accommodations for people. Sure. Um, well, a couple of things come to mind. For one, um, it's really important to note that autistic people, uh, as I talk about my, bo my book, did not feel comfortable going to autism science conferences uh, for decades, a couple of decades, because they were tired of hearing themselves described as burdens upon their families, basically. Yeah. So that, that advisory role, which seems natural in ataxia, um, and actually changed the world in terms of getting homosexuality delisted from the uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or DSM. Um, two things made homosexuality no, no longer a mental illness and none of them were science. One of them was um, radicals, you know, occupying the offices of the American Psychiatric Association. The other was 
psychi gay psychiatrists coming out and saying like, well, actually I don't feel ill. You know, I'm not ill, I'm just oppressed, you know? <laughs> and so when I was in high school, I could have been institutionalized for loving my boyfriend, which I didn't have because I was you know, a part of a stigmatized minority. But, um, you know, now I'm married, so social change can happen, you know. Uh, <laughs> but um, so it was really the patients, you know, who made homosexuality no longer a mental illness. Why weren't, you know, autistic people involved in this process earlier? Well, I can give you a very crisp and horrifying example. I went to um, a, a big, I'm not going to name names, but I went to a very big national autism research conference. And there was a woman there who had been in the field for decades and was getting a Lifetime Achievement Award. And, you know, she's probably done great work, but so I'm sitting in there and I, I did have some autistic friends there. Um, so I was, you know, hearing with their ears in part as well as my own. And so she starts, you know, talking at the podium and she says, you know, the early days of autism research were basically veterinary medicine. I was like, what? Like, you know, like that wouldn't have been said about any other minority without half the room getting up and walking out. You know, like I, I, I couldn't believe it. And, you know, obviously she was talking about nonverbal autistics primarily, but Jesus Christ, you know. So I wouldn't go to those conferences either, although they're going now and they, they've been having a big um, impact on the, on the direction of research, which is good. One of the things that can be done starting in um, elementary school is that individualized education plans or IEPs, which I'm sure all of your the people watching are familiar with, um, or most of them, um, should always say, you know, what is Johnny or Jane or non-binary person good at? As you know, what are they great at? What are they into? Yeah. You know, like yeah. what is their potential? What is their promising potential? Like so many times IEPs are like, you know, Johnny is unable to satisfactorily, you know, Jane is missing her milestone, you know, really like, yeah. what is she into? You know, like, and so I feel like making IEP and some places do do this and, and some, you know, some teachers and parents are able to work this out. Um, but primarily IEP should not just be lists of deficits and things broken to be fixed. Right. They should give a full picture of the humanity of the student so that the teacher can then build on that potential as the first steps on a pathway to success in life. Uh, and I think that would um, help with some of the uh, um, problems in employment later on. Because once people realize that they have natural strengths and natural, uh, you know, oftentimes we refer to autistic interests as obsessions. Well, you can also say that they're passions. Yeah, you know, exactly. that's a better word. You know, and so that's you know making IEPs also about what the kid is really good at. I think uh, would be one step, certainly. Um, and I think that's just generally such a great example of the differences in how we talk about autistic kids versus typical kids. And one of the things I really wanted to ask you about was um, so. I realized that my youngest was autistic in 2014. Um, I had seen in 2009, the infamous I am autism commercial. Um, oh that, that is all I knew about autism at the time. My husband as well, as far, like, as far as we knew, we didn't know other autistic people again, you know, probably I, now I feel like, well, of course, you know, some of those people were autistic, but like you said, they didn't have diagnoses or whatever. Um, that was one of the most vulnerable times in my life because it's the, I don't even know. It's like almost difficult to describe. It's the same child that I was raising. Suddenly I was reading all these terrible things about her, you know, about people like her and, you know, all the deficits and um, 
I remember seeing TV specials where, you know, they would portray little kids with their moms and like, oh, the, you know, the mom was crying because she said the kids didn't care about her. The kids, you know, were just out on a swing by themselves. I had a very grim picture in my mind. Um, and during that time, the parents also have to very quickly decide what therapies or supports or treatments, whatever people call them, are going to do. You, the medical community is saying you have to act now. You know, if you don't do this now, you're going to ruin the rest of their lives. You'll miss the window, which yes. is, by the way, a myth. Terrible. Yeah. And it's so anxiety provoking. Yeah. And it really sets parents off on a terrible path in how they think about their own children. And it's so um, affected by how everyone else around us is talking about it and what they're suggesting, again, based on the, you know, label, you know, and everything that goes with that. So, like, what should new parents know when their child gets diagnosed? I have, just have a pretty short sure thing to say. Uh, remember when I was talking about the, the the two kids that were autistic that sort of inspired me to write Geek Syndrome? One of them, when she was diagnosed, uh, she was told, her father was told by her pediatrician, your daughter is little more than an animal. That girl just graduated college and she's doing great, you know? And so what I would say is that the historical lesson that I saw played out over and over and over again throughout the decades. And weirdly, it was as if this was one of the bits of information that was never transmitted to later generations because of the myths. But don't ever accept dire predictions for your child made when the child is very young because you never know what's gonna happen. Yeah. And that's even true if the child never acquires speech. Um, I've, I've recently uh, been, there's a, um, uh, I think there's a website called Unrestricted Interests or something like that. Um, and it's poetry, there's, it's poetry written by nonverbal autistics. And you don't even have to get into like the debate about AAC and is this, these are not, these kids wrote this stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing, you know, and as they say in the nonverbal community, just because you can't speak doesn't mean you have nothing to say, right. you know. So over and over again, I saw uh, autistic kids becoming autistic adults and exceeding their parents' expectations and exceeding the really the clinicians' expectations, which were always very dire. Up through the 80s, the standard advice that I heard many parents tell me they got was autism is a fate worse than death. You will you'll just have to bear it. And, you know, boy, that's really uplifting yeah. information for, you know, parents. Yeah. But also what I discovered, and this is actually like, I think one of the biggest lessons in my book that is not talked about enough really is that, the reason why those predictions were became standard was because autistic kids were put in institutions where they had no chance for right. education development. They were often subjected to bizarre treatments, you know, and everything from shock therapy to forced LSD. Like the head of Bellevue in uh, New York, Loretta Bender gave a group of autistic kids LSD every day for three months until she discovered that they were becoming more anxious. Well, if I took LSD every day for three months, I'd be really <laughs> anxious, you know? So um, we have to, now we know that autistic people in the wild, as it were, like outside of institutions, if they're given a chance to develop a positive um, self image, and I, I'll give you a very good example. The longest um, profile of a single individual kid in my book is Leah Rosa, daughter of Shannon Rosa of thinkingautism.com, which is a great website. Yes, um, and I would encourage all parents to, to check it out. Um, okay, he's barely verbal. You know, it's true. He's, he's what 
you know, other parents like to describe as severe autism. Um, he is a, he's a very happy kid. It's not that he doesn't have problems. It's not that he doesn't have occasional meltdowns. It's not that he doesn't get overwhelmed. This is all happening at the same time. And in quarantine, you know, it's pretty rough, you know, but he and his mom are getting out there into the wilderness. He's a happy person. And he was not, you know, happy autistic nonverbal people are not supposed to exist. Right. And he's proof that being raised in an atmosphere of support. And by the way, you know, as I describe in my book, um, his parents, when he first got diagnosed, read all those websites, thought it was a disaster, vowed to cure him, tried special diets and all this, thousands of dollars on supplements. It didn't work. They finally came around to the idea that, well, maybe we should try to make Leo happy as he is instead of yeah. perpetually wishing that he was something he's not. So, you know. Yeah, which is just life-changing. So Liz, uh, what would you suggest to new parents as well as clinicians, educators, researchers, just generally? Uh, something when- along the, the lines of, you know, what uh, Steve is saying, you know, embrace the person, find the positive, find the potential to nurture it. We all come to this life with that potential and have the right to be happy. And it's a right, it's a human right. And it's been stepped on many times. And, and sometimes it's, um, you know, unknowingly, sometimes there is good intention. The diagnosis system that we have is, is not without fault, you know. It is an attempt to solve uh to, to, to provide the resources to solve a problem, just a practical matter of here's your piece of paper and you now go and get your insurance coverage for X, Y, and Z. But it doesn't, it, it means nothing. It's just that. It's just a piece of paper. It's just you go. It, it shouldn't be taken as who you are and who you're going to be the rest of your life. It means nothing. It's actually very incomplete. It needs a lot of work. A lot of work for it to be even close to being scientific, by the way. So don't put too much weight on that. It's just an effort that a group of people, and I praise them for the, the effort because it, 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 you know, it brought some evolution and here we are discussing it. So it puts it on the, on, the, on the map. So we can actually be here discussing it. So in that sense, it also gives some people an identity. So if you're an adult and you are now, you, and then we go back to that tension, right? The tension between belonging to a group and being criticized all the time and so on and so on. So from the standpoint of logistics and being practical about it, it's just that. It's just kind of this piece of paper in the United States. But you know, if you go to the Nordic countries and you see these individualized education programs, they exist for every kid. There is no such a thing as special education and they're number one in education. So I tell you something, the first few weeks of classes, you don't, you're not in the classroom sitting there uh, and with a piece of paper in front of you that says, keep your hands quiet. Oh no, you're moving, you're in the wild, you're moving. And people are seeing what your best predispositions and capabilities are. And that's the way it should be. At that early age, it's a process of discovery. Discover what your child is good at naturally and nurture that regardless of the label, you're going to have a label. Okay. That's going to give you some kind of access to services and help you out, but don't take it literally because it is not with many, it has many faults and it's, it, it's not flawless. So, and the person behind the desk who is so-called a professional and an expert is not an expert. No, by any stretch of the imagination, because it's such a complex problem that you cannot possibly have one expert on it. You need an interdisciplinary team to actually help you and and support you. So don't buy into it. Just get your piece of paper, do your services, whatever you need, but love your child and nurture the the capacity and the potential and and go with that. Don't be positive. Yeah, totally agree. Um, Okay, so we only have a little bit of time left. I have to ask you about this, so Steve, because there's so many misconceptions about it and there's so many 
questions about it and it would be wonderful for you to clarify. First, uh, could you talk about the differing operating systems that you've spoken about, which I love, but the other part of that is, um, can you explain neurodiversity and the neurodiversity movement and what are the some what are the misconceptions that go along with that and who does it include well uh yes i mean that's obviously like the the big <laughs> enchilada right um and I'm, go I'm going to push back on the framing of that question a little there's the neurodiversity movement is not this organized group you know there are groups of self-advocates like the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. Uh, Autistic UK in the UK is excellent. I would say that those groups are advocating for neurodiversity to be thought about and accepted. And I think that's a wonderful thing. But people who are anti-neurodiversity uh, for various reasons, um, obviously anti-vaccine people are, are anti-neurodiversity. Uh, because they want autism to be a, di a disease or a syndrome. They want it to be caused by vaccines. They don't want to hear about, well, maybe your kid is okay. You know, maybe you should just be supportive. They don't want to hear about that. Um, then there's this weird crew of people who I don't want to talk about too much because, yeah, I don't want to talk about it. But <laughs> they, um, you know, they insist that the neurodiversity movement um, exaggerates the uh, accomplishments of uh, autistic people like Greta Thunberg while ignoring um, uh, you know, the problems that say nonverbal autistics face. Right. Um, a, I would say like, what have you done for nonverbal autistics lately? You know, and writing nasty tweets about you know, the author of this book called Neurotribes <laughs> is not really helping those people. You know? But um, also I would say um, that that's a misconception. Uh, groups like ASAN have always considered themselves part of the cross disability movement, which means they're not only standing up for nonverbal autistics or autistics with intellectual disability. Uh, and in fact, I just saw a, a, a journalist and neurodiversity advocate named Sarah Luderman, who I like a lot, tweeted a social story about the killing of George Lloyd uh, mm -hmm. for um, people with intellectual disability to understand this very important movement yeah. for, for civil rights. Those are the people, that it's often the neurodiversity people who are championing the needs of the most significantly disabled members, members of the community. Mm -hmm. And um, there's some weird confusion in some people's minds between a very brief internet fad called Aspie supremacy that basically said that people with Asperger's syndrome were better than um, you know, those diaper wearing autistics. It, it, it was like horrible. You know, it was actually ableist, even if the people yeah. doing it were, were you know, had Asperger's syndrome. It was very brief, but a, a, a uh, false association with Aspie, with Aspie supremacy uh, is often used by anti-neurodiversity people to tar and feather, you know, the, the neurodiversity. It's just BS, you yeah. know. Um, neurodiversity speaks up for everyone. Now you asked like, who's in the neuro, you know, who's, who falls within the purview of neurodiversity? Even though I wrote, you know, probably, you know, a very popular book on the subject, I don't know. I think about it a lot. It's complicated. Yeah. Like, like okay, people with schizophrenia. It's really inter That's a really interesting question. I would very much recommend a book by Esme Weijin Wang called "The Collected Schizophrenias" that came out last year or two years ago. Great book. She's schizophrenic herself. Um, seems like they should be included in neurodiversity. But friends of mine who are schizophrenic, they have a really rough time. Like. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so in schizophrenia, perhaps more aggressive treatments will someday be relevant. I'm not saying that neurodiversity says that autistic people should not be treated for things like anxiety right. or, you know, 
let's also, while we're trying to develop anti-anxiety pills that work in the autistic brains, which have, has never been attempted even, what if bullying was reduced in childhood? <laughs> would people be less anxious? That yeah. would be something worth trying, you know? Um, and so I focus on making them, you know, act neurotypical. I mean, that's yep. huge. You know, they say how much huge. trauma that causes them. And it's, it's not really something that is taken into account until, you know, they're adults. And then saying, you know, my childhood was very traumatic. It's, um, oh, absolutely. Well, you know, I write in the book about where that, at least part of where that came from, which was uh, Ivar Lovas, the inventor of ABA. One of his agenda items was um, forcing, you know, at pain of electric shock, even forcing autistic kids to act neurotypical so they would not shame their families in public. Mm -hmm. And that, as I, as I very carefully map out, that is inextricable from the fact that for decades, autism parents were mistakenly blamed for yeah. causing autism in their children. So, uh, you know, by various BS artists like Bruno Bettelheim, who wrote the most influential book on autism in the 1960s, The Empty Fortress, where he compared autism moms to concentration camp commandants, and no one challenged him because he had been in a concentration camp. So he had this cred, you know, that he did not deserve. He was a complete fraud. And he used to abuse his patients as well. Um, but so basically, it's impossible to understand where these beliefs are coming from without understanding autism history. And that's what I excavated and tried to make available to the world in a hopefully engaging form. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a thick book, <laughs> but if you're home in quarantine and need something to read, Perfect binge class. read it. You know? <laughs> and you, can, you know, it's also available in uh, audio. But um, I, I feel like we had a lot of catching up to do, and that's yeah. why I wrote Neurotribes, so that we could understand why things are so messed up now yeah. um, because of things that happened in the past and then had cascading effects down through the decades. Yeah. So because those things. Are, were so messed up and still are. Liz, what is different about NJ ACE and where is the future of neuroscience taking us? Well, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's an evolving process clearly. And I'm very positive about the future because um, Understanding that historical context that Steve described so well in his book and making us aware of that gives us uh, continuity so we can see how we can move forward and take advantage of uh, several revolutions that have taken place in, in our contemporary times. The neuroscience revolution that has been um, nurtured by at least two decades of uh, federal funding and state funding, uh, the, the decade of the, of the brain and the brain initiative under two different uh, presidents, uh, President Bush and President Obama. Then we also have the genomic revolution that has been uh, fast uh, progressing and the wearable sensor revolution, which is recent, but it will give us a, a chance to measure uh, the biorhythmic activity uh, of the nervous system and help uh, create support and, and accommodations for independent, for independent living, for independence, for autonomy, which I think is very important to keep our, our dignity, to, to try to be as much as possible independent and cre create a voice and communicate uh, to the world our needs and it, independent of any diagnosis. This is just human uh, nature. Uh, in the case of autism, it will, it will help a lot of people. And so I think that combining all of that with a, with a movement um, that gives us the, the, the proper historical perspective, the proper uh, social uh, perspective, the rights, the human rights of people, uh, I think is positive. And I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, 
criticize uh, the, the past. It's not, you know, we shouldn't be very harsh on, 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 on what brought us here because we're here because of that. It's, it's kind of um, an exercise in, in self-correction, if you will. And, but it is books like uh, Steve's book and that very serious uh, scientific work, very rigorous work, to, to place it in historical in a historical context that helps us be better because we know where we're coming from and by continuity we know where we should be uh, going to. So I'm very positive about the future and the NJA is, is part of that. It, it's embracing that future uh, with technology, with innovation, and and with with the social uh, rights uh, movement. So yeah. And it's very wonderful to be a part of it. I'm so I'm so grateful that you, there's so many um, there's just so many people now who are listening to autistic people and you know scientists who are embracing fields that you know weren't historically even considered for this population, um, and it's just really wonderful. Um, Steve, I want I'm very to optimistic. Uh, like, yeah. uh, don't worry, I'm not going to talk for more than 10 seconds. It's fine. I'm very optimistic about this. It's a very pessimistic time. We have yes. some really serious problems. Very sad. That we have yeah. to address as a yeah. society. You can yeah. see it every day in the news and on Twitter. But about this, about the future of neurodiversity, about the future of inclusion, I'm incredibly optimistic and inspired. And yeah. everybody who is part of NJH, ACE, and watching this broadcast can do their little bit to push the world forward. And that makes me very hopeful. Yeah, definitely agree. Um, Thank you so much, Steve. Yes. Thank you. Steve, I wanted to ask you one more. Um, you have a new book that you're working on. Can I you do. tell us about it? And uh, it's yeah. It, different from the audience? It's different, yeah. I'll try to be quick because I know we're running short on time. Um, it's not going to be out for several years, probably. Um, it's called The Taste of Salt. It's a history of cystic fibrosis. Um, cystic fibrosis, uh, like autism in a sense, has been surrounded by a lot of kind of shame and secrecy, but for different reasons. Um, it's it's because cystic fibrosis is basic, basically, it's it's primarily... A disease that involves mucus, so that's kind of a taboo, yeah. taboo subject. But the good news is that tremendous advances have been made in the treatment of cystic fibrosis, both pharmaceutically and, and non-pharmaceutically, so much so that what used to be an almost inevitably fatal diagnosis decades ago, now people live into their middle age and even older and have families of their own. It's one of the biggest medical success stories of our time and hardly anybody knows about it because cystic fibrosis is relatively rare and people often don't talk about it. One interesting difference between the autistic community and the CF community is that CF, like for autistic people, being able to come together in physical form uh, was very important for them. Uh, CF people can't do that so much because there's a possibility of cross infection. Right. Hey, in a way it's like, and I've heard CF people say this, we kind of are all living as if we have CF now. Yeah. You know, it's like, we're all in quarantine. We're all worried about being, uh, you know, getting a virus from people around us. CF people have been dealing with that for decades. They're experts at not getting viruses and not getting the flu. Uh, and, the, you know, they've been teaching people how to cough into their elbows, not <coughs> coughing into the air, you know, for decades. So, uh, my next book will be Taste of Salt, out in probably three years, maybe two or three years. That sounds wonderful. Um, Thank you. Do we have time for one question? Sure. Okay. Just one question from sure. uh, a mom. She says, how can we create opportunities in various fields for neurodiverse people to land jobs and have meaningful careers? Well, part of it is that um, if you think about what... Uh, people are supposed to do in job interviews. It's like a list of stuff that many autistic people find hard to do. Like firm handshake, strong eye contact, 
sell yourself. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, Temple Grandin points out that if you're artistic and looking for a job, you, sh you should let your work sell itself. You know, foreground your portfolio of work and accomplishments. Um, another blockade against uh, full autistic employment, particularly in Silicon Valley, where uh, autistic traits can help really perform lots of different jobs, not just coding, um, is that the young people, I don't want to be like, okay, boomer here, but the young <laughs> people, you know, in Silicon Valley who do the hiring, they're often looking for real team players. Right. Well, you know, autistic people are not generally real team players with, you know, charming, rich, young neurotypicals. You know, uh, in fact, the virtue of autistic people is that they see things, they see problems from different angles and think outside of the box and all that. And um, I have a wonderful quick story that I'll tell uh, from Jose Velasco, who um, runs the Autism at Work program for SAP, a big software developer. Um, and former employer of Peter, who is editing this video. Hi, Peter. <laughs> um, and, uh, anyway, he told me that he got inspired to start um, thinking about ways to increase autistic employment. One day when he was in his car with his young daughter, who had been nonverbal for several years when she was young. Uh, you know, sometimes young autistic people lose speech and then recover it for reasons that are still mysterious. Um, but so Peter was driving through the desert, I think it was in Arizona. They were in the middle of nowhere and he suddenly realized he'd forgotten to fill the gas tank. And so it's like, oh no, you know, we're in the desert. I don't have any, all right. So he looks on the GPS, no gas stations for miles mm -hmm. around. So he thought, oh my God, this is horrible, you know? And, and then his daughter who, who had recovered her speech by that point, recovered her speech, said, uh, there's a gas station about 10 miles ahead on the right. And it was like, how did she know this? You know, they drive 10 miles, there it is, there's a gas station. And how did she know this? Then Jose remembered that when his daughter was nonverbal, they had driven the same road when she was very little and she had remembered exactly where the gas station was. Wow. And so, Surely there is some way to draw on that kind of intelligence. Yeah. Um, as, as Finnish school teachers say, we can't afford to waste a brain. So that's the project that we're all involved with. So true. Steve, I can't tell you how much it means to all of us that you joined us today. And we're so grateful for your book. Your, I highly recommend anyone who loves an autistic person to please read the book the history is such an important part of the story and we can't do better for everyone unless we have the full picture. So thank you so much again. And um, hopefully we'll all stay healthy during this pandemic and be able to uh, get outside soon. <laughs> I hope so too. Thank you, uh, Jan and Liz. And thank you, Peter and Joe, uh, the invisible helpers of this production. <laughs> um, and uh, I really am very, very honored to uh, have been with you and uh, NJH this week. Thank, Thank you. you.